Okay, Holly, go ahead. Okay. Hi, I'm Holly Betts. I'm the program manager at the Westport Center for Senior Activities. And I, um, about once or twice a quarter, I do a lecture series called The History of Food in Recipes. So um, we talk about ancient recipes. And I think that we don't always realize that where we're eating today, somebody was consuming hundreds and thousands of years ago. So we've been uh, having a good time looking at different old recipes and talking about that time and the availability of food and, and um, how food has evolved. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. A little bit about my background. Uh, I have a master's in hotel administration from the Cornell University Hotel School. Uh, I am a um, registered dietitian and I majored in food and nutrition sciences at, the, um, at Hood College. And I used to teach at the dietetics program for, and the, actually the hospitality program at the University of New Haven. Um, so I've been kind of, food has been a big part of my life ever since home ec at Long Lots Junior High back in way back when. So, so today I'm gonna to talk about the early history of chocolate. And um, we are going to go to my PowerPoint. So let me just share the screen. And I am going to share. Um, okay. Okay. So this is the early history of chocolate. Chocolate's been around with the Asia, the uh, Aztecs, and the Mayans. And the Olmecs, another, and that actually was a question on Jeopardy last night. Oh, wow. and the answer was the Olmecs, and I thought, well, I knew that, so that was kind of fun. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, how, what does, where does chocolate come from? A little bit of botany, a little bit of, you know, kind of the amazing thing about this particular fruit uh, that grows um, in middle America, in middle Central America, in Mesoamerica. We'll give you a little history about that. And then we're gonna talk about how um, chocolate went from this pod and a drink, it was actually a drink uh, with the Mayans and the Aztecs. It became currency eventually, eventually went to Spain and then um, to Europe. And then from Europe, it came back to, to, to the North America, Morgan, North American continent. So, so this is a picture of a cacao tree. Um, and I, if you can see, can they can see my cursor? Can you see my arrow? Uh -huh. Okay, no. so that, so you can see, and you'll see more pictures of this, the, the bee, the pods, the cacao pod, where we get co cocoa and chocolate from, it grows off the trunk in the large branches. So you don't see the pods up here with the green leaves like you would with an apple tree. They actually grow off the stem. So, um, and they grow in this area called um, Mesoamerica. And so you'll see that it's just south of Mexico um, and north of Honduras and, and Nicaragua. And that's really where it was first recorded as having been grown. Um, so it all starts with a cacao tree. And again, you see that picture of the tree and you see how they're coming off the trunk. So it's like I said, it's not like an apple tree where they come off the top uh, where the leaves are. They actually come off the trunk. Uh, it, the, there's something called theobroma. It's a, um, it's a taxonomic classification for the plant. Uh, the tree is small. It's 13 to 26 feet high. It's in the evergreen family, so it never loses its leaves. Um, it's native to the deep tropical regions of Central uh, and South America. And it, again, so what you see in this picture is mm -hmm. these are called cushions. And these cushions are on the, the trunk of the tree. And out comes a flower. You see the flower coming out. That flower then becomes a pod. And it becomes a big pod. And that then is harvested. And those the um, seeds is where we get cocoa from. Mm. Okay. This is interesting. Um, the tree is very difficult to grow. It won't bear fruit outside a band of 20 degrees north and 20 degrees south of the equator. It won't bear fruit if temperatures drop below 60 degrees. It will not grow if the climate has a dry season. And then um, monkeys and squirrels steal the pods for the flesh inside, so they, uh, but they don't digest the seeds. But um, if you didn't have it fenced, similar to us in, in Connecticut, if we don't have it fenced, the, the deer eat everything. Um, and uh, where they grow them now with the farms, they all have to be fenced in because monkeys and squirrels will, will steal them. So, um, so the yield actually is, is pretty low for growing cacao. If the conditions are right, um, the seeds will, if you 
take the seeds out of the pod. I'm going to show you how that ha happens. Um, they'll sprout within days. Young trees bear fruit by the third or fourth year of being planted. Flowers, again, come from the cushions and the trunk and large branches. Um, and then it's very important they have midges that pollinate each flower. So each fruit yields 30 to 40 uh, seeds or, or cocoa beans. Uh, and they're surrounded by a sweet and juicy pulp. And then when they're um, in modern uh, cacao farms, only one to three percent of the flowers will bear fruit. So oh, I have a question. Yeah. Is that a hard shell or a soft shell outside? Um, it would be similar to a squash. Oh, OK. OK, so right. sort of kind of hard. You, and then inside is a soft flesh. You know, I'm going to show you a video that shows it. Oh, okay. uh, pods take four to five months to mature and then another month to ripen. So, so the yield on this is very low. Even in modern farming times now, um, the yield is very low, which means that chocolate is ex an expensive uh, product to grow. Seeds are separated from the flesh and then they're fermented, dried, roasted. And then there's a term called winnowed, which is removing the outer shell from the bean. So we just get the cocoa and the fat that comes with it. And I'm gonna show you a video on how this happens. And this young man, what he does is he actually makes a chocolate bar from the, um, it's here. Hang on, I gotta share sound, okay. Um, I think it's, no, it's not this one, it's this one. Okay, here we go. So this is a video on how chocolate, he actually in his house is gonna make a chocolate bar by buying these cacao pods that he ordered, but I think they came from Venezuela. There's such a wide range of products out there. You've got your really basic chocolate sound, like Jason? Hershey's, that I believe only has like 10% cacao in it. It's mostly sugar, binders, that kind of thing. But let's face it, it tastes kind of good. And then you've got your really nice high-end single origin chocolate brands that really take the whole process seriously, are very transparent about everything, and make some damn good chocolate. And then you've got what I'm about to make. It's not something you'd come across in your average grocery store, or any grocery store for that matter. Chocolate fresh from a cacao bar. Wow. Now, this is a cacao pot. And as you can see, they come in all sorts of colors, shapes, and sizes. What we're going for when we make chocolate is something beautifully smooth on the bottom, and we want that really nice snap. Listen. Mm. Now, about 70% of the world's cacao beans come from the Ivory Coast, Ghana, Nigeria, and Cameroon. These beauties are from Ecuador. Let's open them up. I'll start by karate chopping a couple pots. Inside are the cacao beans. These have a beautiful white flesh around them that you can drink the water from, meaning cacao is actually a fruit. The beans are really slimy, and in my opinion, have a flavor that's somewhat similar to lychee, maybe a little bit of citrus, and some Jolly Rancher. It's a really hard to describe flavor, but it's one of my favorite fruits in the world. This is what the inside of the seeds look like. They're a beautiful purple color, and as you roast them, they begin to turn a darker brown color. We'll start by taking all the seeds and placing them into a bowl. This is more than enough for a couple chocolate bars. I'm now gonna cover these up and let them ferment. The fermentation allows them to develop those flavors we know and love in chocolate. This will take about a week. The beans have fully fermented. They have an alcoholic smell to them, have turned a little bit brown, and are ready for the second step of the process of making chocolate, roasting. We'll take a small sheet tray and dump our cacao seeds across it. I'll spread these all out in a nice even layer. Notice I still have some of that flesh that's slightly dried up on the outside of each pot. That's okay, we'll remove the shells after we roast. I'll roast these at 300 Fahrenheit for about an hour and a half or until they're clearly well brown. As you can see, oh, these are dry. Wow. First, we'll peel away the shell, revealing the bean inside. If I crumble this up, this makes cacao nibs, which you may recognize. They're often sprinkled on top of things like smoothie bowls. It can take a while to sort all these out, but because I'm making just one bar, this should be plenty. We'll first dump in all of our cacao nibs. I'll follow this with just a light sprinkle of sugar. That's it. This chocolate's gonna be simple, delicious, and pure. And no, it's not gonna be too bitter. Then we blend it up. After a few minutes of blending, it'll be a fine powder like this. Just let it keep going and wait. Eventually, you'll get a fine paste. Turn this off. Pour this into a chocolate mold. I'm not gonna bother with tempering this chocolate. Instead, I'll just toss it in a freezer. And what we'll end up with is a smooth looking chocolate bar with a slightly granular crunch from the sugar that actually cuts down on the bitterness. I'll smooth this over and our chocolate's ready to go into the freezer. And here it is. Our chocolate's ready to open up. As you can see, we have a really, really nice smooth finish on the bottom and that's what I was looking for. But here is the moment of truth. Mm. 
Now that right there is our very own chocolate bar. We just made chocolate from cacao. Give yourself a little pat on the back. That's beautiful. Even just going through the process by hand of what I just did and getting from this to this is fascinating to me. Obviously, it's no surprise that foods go through a variety of processes to get where they end up, at least for some products. But to actually do it and see it by hand is a totally different animal. Let's see if this passes the couple of our tests. The first thing when it comes to chocolate is sight. You want this nice, warm, brown color, and I think we passed the test on that one. The second, touch. We want a smooth, silky surface, and we've nailed that. Third, sound. That's the snap test. Perfect. We've nailed the snap test down to the last square. Fourth, smell. You wanna feel like you're in a chocolate factory when you smell a good piece of chocolate. It should rush through your entire body. That deep, rich cacao flavor that we worked so hard to get, and I get it. And last but not least, hopefully you can guess this one, taste. Mm. That is delicious. What's amazing about this chocolate is that even though we only put cacao and sugar, this has a ton of flavors on its own. The main note I think I get is vanilla, but believe me when I tell you that there are a symphony of flavors in this chocolate bar. I am really proud of the chocolate that we just made. I'll be shipping cacao pods all the way from Ecuador to my home turf of Boston all year to make these videos for you. So don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. And if you really don't wanna miss any of my crazy cacao adventures, don't forget to turn on notifications. I'm gonna go. So now I gotta go back. Very good. Oops, what happened? You gotta pause him. Go back in your video. Go back to my video. Chocolate from the tree to a chocolate bar on the homestead. You make me want to get a chocolate bar here. Wait a minute, I lost myself. What did I do? What did I do? Yeah, but I know I have that on my thing. Right? Uh, well, I think. What happened? Oh, there we go. Oh, now I'm on the chocolate. Oh, you're rude, Alan. Okay. Okay. Go back here, then. Yeah. And then you get it. And I should go back. Sure, got that one. Okay. Should be good. And they can see that now? You guys can see my screen? Yes. Okay, hold on a minute. Okay, so any questions on that? That was wonderful. Yeah, so um, so actually that's pure chocolate. Chocolate is very high in antioxidants, which is very healthy for you. Um, and when you buy, you know, dark chocolate, it's the same thing that it's a, it says percentage of chocolate. So that particular bar he made is probably 98% chocolate. So when you go to the store I, and you see a chocolate bar that's 90% chocolate, that's what he just made. So that means it's very little sugar. It's all from uh, the inside of the cacao bean. Okay, so, so the most important thing that we know and that tells us that chocolate and, co and this chocolate drink, cocoa, drinking chocolate has been around um, since the Mayan and Aztec times is that there is something called theobromine and it's a breakdown of caffeine actually. Um, it's found only in 19 species in, in the plant world. Uh, many of these plants also provide us with caffeine which makes sense because caffeine is, is actually, is the kind of major project product and when caffeine breaks down, one of the breakdown, um, uh, chemicals is called theobromine. So theobromine can be found in the cola nut of Africa, tea leaves and coffee beans. That's where we find caffeine. Um, it's a stimulant, a vasodilator and a diuretic, very similar to what caffeine does for us. Um, the cacao tree is the only plant in Mesoamerica that contains both theobromine and caffeine. So when they, when they did archeological archeolog digs and they found um, carafes and jugs that would have held chocolate, um, they are able even today to do, to test them and see if they can find traces of caffeine and theobromine in on those clay pots, which I'm gonna show you. So that's how they were able to establish that drinking hot chocolate, or actually they, not, they don't know if they drank it hot or cold, probably they drank it cold, but they've been drinking a cocoa drink since, as I said, the Olmecs and the Aztecs and the Mayans, because 
when they did digs, they then ran tests on those particular um, clay pieces that they found, and they found that these two, um, that theobromine was there, and that then would tell them that Coke, they were um, drinking chocolate at that time. They all, we also have other proof that it's been around uh, forever. Um, mm -hmm. so, so there's archeological evidence. In 2006, Jeffrey Hurst of Hershey Foods showed that caffeine and theobromine can be detected from substances straight from archeological ceramics. Um, the lab have found these two substances in ceramics that date back 38 centuries, predating San Lorenzo Olmex. And that's what that big, um, this sculpture here is um, from San Lorenzo. And that's where the Olmex um, resided. So uh, we found, they found some of their jugs and um, vessels that they drank out of, and they found that theobromine was there so they could um, confirm that in fact they were drinking chocolate. So cacao beverage, it's most commonly used in several drinks and gruels, the most common being a frothy beverage that was served to royals and newly married couples. This is back again in the Olmec and uh, Mayan and Aztec times. Chocolate had an extremely important place in the religious, spiritual, and cultural life of the Mayan people. And um, it's depicted on vases, murals, and other pieces of art. It's used as a gift, it was used as a gift to the deities presented at royal burials to ensure comfort in the afterlife and even used as currency. So it was really for the high class, for the upper class. The, the um, slaves and the low class, lower classes were, did not have access to this beverage. Um, the typical preparation of co cocoa involved harvesting the beans, fermenting them, roasting them, and grinding them to a paste. And that's, that's what that gentleman did on the video. So nothing's changed. You basically have to ferment, bent, ferment, you know, take the bean out of the pod, ferment the beans, roast them, and then grind them into a paste. And what you see here, is a, um, and you can still buy them when you go to Mexico or you go to a shop that has Mexican items, you'll see these and it's, it's got rings. These are rings and you do this with your hands. It's almost like a whisk. And what that does is it adds um, air to the cocoa and then it makes a froth. So the way it was served is sort of like, you know, a beer is served today or a, um, you go to Starbucks and you get a latte with a foam on top. And that was um, the way it was served. So they wanted to put, they mixed air into it to get that frothy top. The base was mixed with water to which often added, then they added corn or chili peppers and spices. I'll talk about that a little later to give it flavor. Um, they mixed with this molinette. This is called a molinette uh, to make a frothy beverage. Um, sugar didn't come yet. So in the Mayan Aztec Olmec times, um, the, the um, Cocoa was there was not sweetened. Uh, maybe that's why they would add some chili peppers or they add cinnamon. Maybe that was to cut the bitterness. But um, at this point in the Maya Aztec times, they're not um, adding sugar. Sugar wasn't um, available at the time. It was drunk on occasion by most people. Uh, cocoa was a more regular beverage of the privileged, including priests, rulers, soldiers, and other members of high social class. Um, so they discovered the a stone bowl. Um, the Hershey lab found it positive for theobromine at um, El, El Maniati. This is their, their ruins. It was 1350 BC. So we know that um, they were drinking cocoa in 1350 BC. Um, so it's one of the oldest kind of foods that's been recorded, and it's been recorded throughout history. They have, um, because of this ability to um, isolate the theobromine off of the um, clay pots that they, they collected. It was discovered at Colha, Northern Belize. Um, so what they did, they found, they think the, these pots, this particular pot, which is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, that pot is dated by carbon dating, they can date it, uh, is 600 BC. And it was, theobromine was detected. It's the, early it's the earliest evidence of chocolate in the Maya area. So do you see this, this spout? So that's actually like a uh, pipe. So there's a hole in there. They would put their mouth on the top of it and blow into it. And of course, what would that do? That's gonna create the frog, right? So instead of having that thing that the, the Mexicans did, they actually just would put their mouth, they made these um, ceramic vases vases they call them and then they would just blow into it get air into it and then that would um create that froth 
that they would um, eat. And then this is a, just a picture of Coja. Um, has anybody been to the Mayan ruins or Aztec ruins in Mexico? No, I'm, I have not either. Um, yes, I grew up there. I grew oh. up in that part of the world. Oh, and, okay. I was just, and I was just looking, I have, I have uh, pre-Columbians and I was just uh, looking through them. Yeah. Uh, I can I can show them to you. Okay. Uh, I, you can if you, if you want to, but go ahead and go on with your maybe at the end of your. Of sure. Your talk. Yeah. So here's okay. another. Um, this this particular um, vase was found 600 A.D. They they were able to um, date it, and again you see that, you know the pipe in order to get the air into it. So again it was used for chocolate preparation. So I, I think it's amazing. I mean, 600 AD that, you know, they were making these ceramics um, and then they were, like I said, they were harvesting the cacao bean to, um, into cocoa. Okay, so um, Mayan hieroglyphics. In the pre-conquest New World hier hieroglyphics was only known to Mesoamerica. Um, they did research and showed that the Maya could write everything in their language. The language was phonetic, sil syllabic, and partly semantic. Uh, they wrote on bark paper, much of which was destroyed with the ninth century collapse of the Mayan culture or burned in the Spanish Inquisition. Um, this has been saved and um, people have studied it and they actually um, have evidence that they, they were drinking cocoa So um, at that point. The 1950s, hello, yeah. Okay. In the 1950s, uh, there was a re uh, Russian um, epigographer. Uh, he, cracked, he cracked the phonetic code, and um, we can now read Mayan text. So there's something called the Dresden Codex survived, and that's what this is. This is called the Dresden Codex. So it sort of looks like a book. Um, in several sections, uh, they write of Mayan rituals and show drawings of the gods holding cacao pods. That's how they, again, they, 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 as we said on the previous slide, it was very phonetic. So cacao pods, that's the way they spelled it. Um, and seeds, 460, this is dated to 460, 480 AD. Um, a Mayan tomb um, from the site of Rio Azul had vessels with, a, um, with a, again, a Maya glyph for cacao on them. Um, and uh, so that suggests that people were drinking chocolate from 400 AD. So it even dates back um, earlier than the, the last pot we saw, which was the 600 AD. Um, and then cacao pods are used as currency. The Aztecs believed the cacao seeds were the gift of Quasicotl, the god of wisdom, and the seeds once had so much value, they were used as a form of currency. One of the earliest notices of this drink is the hand of a man known as, uh, to scholars as Anonymous Conqueror. Okay. Not as Conqueror description was published in Venice in 1556. The seeds, which are called almonds or cacao, are ground and made into powder, and other small seeds are ground into the powder and put into basins with a point, and then they put water on it and mixed it with a spoon. After mixing it very well, they change it from one basin to another so that the foam is raised, which they put in the vessel for that purpose. So we keep seeing the same thing, that it was always served with a foam on top, and and the different cultures figured out different ways to make that happen. So um, this group actually would just transfer it from one container to another to get enough air into it to create that foam. Okay. Um, again, this uh, particular document that they were able to translate is when they um, wish to drink it, they mix it with certain small spoons of gold or silver or wood and drink it and drinking it one, uh, one must, this is a quote, must open one's mouth because being foam, one must give room to subside and go down bit by bit. So this is kind of a modern cup, but what they did to drink it is they would have to get beyond the foam, which end, you end up kind of with that mustache thing, but, and you suck the, this part out through the foam and that's the way it was, it was consumed. Uh, the drink is the healthiest thing and the greatest substance you could drink in the world. And that was, again, a quote from that um, document that they were talking about. So then they flavored it. And again, I said that um, back in the early, um, and again, in Mayan, Aztec, Olmec times, um, 
they did not have sugar. So, um, and I think that if you've ever tasted, a, have you ever tasted, anybody tasted a chocolate bar with like 90% cocoa? Mm. Yeah. It's bitter, it's, um, it's hard because there's no fat, not a lot of fat in it. It's all cacao. Um, yeah, it doesn't taste very good. No, it doesn't taste very good. And I think that um, what they did is that they added, um, I'm not sure if corn would, well, I'm thinking, why would they add corn to it? My guess is that they would have dried the corn or roasted the corn and corn has a lot of starch in it. And if you roast it, what happens to corn is it gets sweet because the sugars in the corn caramelize. So it's possible, if I had to guess, they probably added roasted corn to it and ground it up, which would add some sweetness. Um, ground seed of the silk cotton tree. And this is actually a cotton tree, which is also called K-pop. K-A-P-O-K, -K. does that mean anything to anybody? K-pop? Mm -hmm. so, yes, yes, that's capote. It's a, it's a, um, it's a fruit, capote. Yes, well, it, yeah, and so this is actually it right down here. But yes, also, that's it. Yep, yep, and um, it also create inside is I think I mean, it could be wrong, but it, it, it's, it's a very fleshy. It's a very fleshy, fleshy, beautiful red fruit. Yep. And so they would actually grind the seed of the kapok um, and uh, add that. Capote. Yeah, capote. Um, they would add green cacao, uh, cacao pods. Um, the flesh of the the cacao pod is actually sweet. Um, oh. And that's actually true of any fruit, right? So the seed isn't the sweet, it's the, it's the fruit part, the flesh that's protecting it is sweet. So there would have been some sweetness in there. They did know what honey was um, and they could add honey to it. They did harvest honey and then the vanilla flower, um, which would have given it some flavor. So those are very typical flavors. I didn't put cinnamon in here. The, um, the Mexicans add cinnamon to their, to their chocolate, um, their hot chocolate. So back to cacao beans as currency. At the time of the Spanish conquest, cocoa uh, bean currency in the commercially active economy of the Aztec empire ranked above gold dust as the principal form of money. The Aztecs kept cocoa beans in um, holding um, in bags holding 24,000 beans. And here's a little chart that I got. It says, what did a hundred cocoa beans buy in 1540 in Mexico? You could get one turkey, three rabbits, 33 avocados newly picked, mm. 33 fish wrapped in maize husk, oh, 100, wow. or 100 potatoes. Yeah. Um, the thing that I, I don't understand is when you have something like cocoa beans that are currency, can anybody then grow money? I don't see how that works. <laughs> uh, but apparently they were able to um, control the, the amount that people grew. The Aztecs also used copper hatchets at money as money, and Cortez, in a letter to the King of Spain in 1524, referred to a copper hatchet as worth 8,000 cocoa beans. So it was used to, as trading and bartering. Um, during the 18th century, reports from Mexico indicated that the cultivation of cacao beans was restricted to maintain the value of cocoa beans as money. So they were able to um, restrict the amount of cocoa that they released out as money. So in some ways, it's sort of like our Federal Reserve Bank and how much money they they, they let out um, and how much money they made. So um, kind of interesting. So Columbus arrives um, in Mesoamerica in 1502. I'm sure you all know that he was headed for Jamaica. Um, he miscalculated his route and he missed Jamaica and he kept going. Um, he ended up... Uh, in Guahana Island, 30 miles north of the Honduran mainland. And as I said before, we saw the first map, um, cacao grows 20 degrees north or south of the equator. So they would have had cacao um, trees there on the island, 30 miles north of Honduras. Um, he reported on his um, findings. And this is what um, Columbus wrote in his journal. They seem to hold these almonds at a great price. He was referring to the cocoa beans. For when they were brought on board ship together with goods, I observed when any of these almonds fell, they stooped to pick it up as if an eye had fallen. <laughs> kind of an interesting description. Um, Columbus never tasted chocolate. Um, he turned his fleet towards Panama, finding gold at last, and then four years later, he would die in Spain. 
Uh, but but they, he did, again, as the story of Coco goes and the history of Coco, he did record that in 1502, it was in fact used as well. So then we have the Spanish Inquisition. Um, initially, the Spanish were far more interested in cacao's use as currency rather than its culinary use. As the Spanish colonists settled in, taking Native women as wives or concubines, a kind of hybridization uh, between the two cultures began, it resulted in the addition of cane sugar to the unsweetened drink of the Aztecs. So mm. when the Spanish came to settle uh, Mesoamerica, they brought sugar cane. And so now we would see chocolate um, having, they would add the cane, grow cane sugar, uh, produce cane sugar, and then add it to this unsweetened drink that the Aztecs had. And, um, and they would also, again, then add the chili and the dried flowers, spices familiar to Europeans. The Europeans brought cinnamon, anise, and black pepper, and would add that to the cocoa drink. Um, and so that's how we got the cane sugar and the, the um, cocoa together. So cultural hybridization not only changed the drink, it changed the name of the drink. So by the 1750s, the Spanish were using um, chocolate, choc I can't remember this, chocolate or whatever, <laughs> a combination of Mayan word for hot and the Aztec word for, wor for water. So that's the first time we actually see it re referred to as drinking it hot. And again, this is a picture showing you that the, they would have had it with a froth because um, that was the traditional way to drink it. So um, then it was brought to, after the Spanish Inquisition, uh, the uh, Spanish would bring it back to uh, Prince Philip um, to thank him, uh, Prince Philip of Spain. And then um, the Quechua Maya of, Guat of Guatemala brought presents to the prince, um, including chocolate. So, so that's, this is when it comes to Europe and actually came to Europe after the Spain, with the Spanish Inquisition. And so the Spaniards um, kept the chocolate secret to themselves. They didn't let other countries know. <laughs> they, kept, they decided that it was um, a health food and a medicine, which it is. I mean, it um, at the time they didn't know it, but again, I said chocolate is a very, very good high source of um, antioxidants, which is very healthy for you and for your heart. Um, the doctors prescribed it for curing fevers, cooling the body, aiding indigestion, and alleviating pain. So, so it wasn't dr drunk for just the culinary purpose, it was considered a medicine. And again, Spain didn't want anybody else to know about this. Um, the church in Spain approved it as a nutritional su supplement to take while fasting. Well, that was very exciting to um, mm. the Spaniards because, uh, so they didn't have, it, it didn't count towards fasting. Sort of like drinking, you know, water or whatever, it didn't count. So they could, during fasting times, they could, they could drink yeah. chocolate. Um, chocolate in Europe. Chocolate soon made its way to the rest of Europe. It was a big hit in Louis the Fourteenth's court. Um, and this is actually a picture in 1657. The first chocolate house opened in London. So instead of having like a pub or a brew house, um, they had chocolate houses. And eventually, um, flavors familiar to Europeans, such as cinnamon and milk, found their way into the mix. Um, so the, um, the Europeans are the first to actually add milk to it. Is that where Willy Wonka came from? Uh, <laughs> is that right? Uh, so chocolate spreads through Europe. Um, to keep up with demand, plantations sprung up and thousands of people were enslaved to produce cacao. Rather than rely on the Spanish, the British, the Dutch, and the French, the, uh, the Spanish, um, the British, the Dutch, and the French would start their own plantations, taking cacao out of Central America and planting it in their own territories, Sri Lanka, Venezuela, Java, Sumatra, the West Indies, and Africa. So it originally, the cacao plant was only grown in Mesoamerica um, and then not until the Europeans decided that this cocoa uh, was, you know, just that they needed to, to have it. They wanted their own supply. They didn't want to have to pay the Spanish for it. So they made their own. So it, grew, it then the plant actually was taken to Sri Lanka. And again, these are all countries that are 20 degrees north or south of the equator, which is the only place it can grow. And again, you're seeing how they grow off the um, off the uh, trunks as opposed to in the leaves section. So um, as the supply increased, prices went down, chocolate becomes increasingly available to the middle and lower classes. 
Um, when the middle and lower classes got a hold of it, chocolate really took off. So in the early 1800s, um, Conrad Van Houten, a Dutchman, created the Dutch press. And the press smashed the beans and expelled the cocoa butter fat, mm. leaving just the cocoa behind. Mm. And that's what this machine is. So he invented this machine. It would crush the, the bean and take the um, actual cocoa fat out of it and just leave you with um, dried cocoa. Uh, Van um, Houten also came up with a way to wash the cocoa in an alkali solution, hence the, the, the word Dutch process cocoa, which makes it easier to mix with water and also easier to mix with milk as well. So um, does anybody know what Dutch process cocoa is? No. No? <laughs> so um, I took a lot of food science in college. Um, and um, so when you're baking, and you're using baking powder, right? You put baking powder in something to make it rise. Mm -hmm. uh, baking powder is a combination of, um, actually it's a combination of baking soda, but it also has a dried acid in it. So if you take basic baking soda and you put vinegar in it, um, you automatically produce carbon dioxide, which is bubbles, which creates the leavening agent for, that was kind of the first modern, um, uh, leavening agent. There's a lot of different ways when you're baking to get something to rise. So there's yeast, um, there's baking soda plus an acid, which can be vinegar or lemon juice, any kind of acid. Um, you can have baking powder that already has a dried acid in it. So when you add water, the acid mixed with the baking soda. And um, there's also called baker's ammonia, um, which I just experimented with this Christmas. I made some cookies with baker's ammonia. Um, that was a lot of fun. I'd like to do a cooking class with that at some point. Um, and that's just a different, um, that reacts with heat. Actually, it's not water that makes it um, produce carbon dioxide, it's the heat that does it. But anyway, long story short is that Dutch cocoa, when you take um, cocoa beans and you know he had that paste, so, and then you would dry that and make dried cocoa powder. So um, that is a very acidic um, product. You end up with a very acidic pH when you do that. If you do his, his um, he washes it in an alkali solution, he reduces the, the, the acid content down to more of an um, alkaline um, pH, which means that it mixes with water and it will mix with fat much easily, more easily. But if you use Dutch cocoa to bake with and you're not using, um, and you're just using baking soda, you won't get any rise because there's no acid in it. To remove the acid from the bean. So um, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So you that's um so a lot of recipes will say, you know, don't use Dutch processed in this recipe. That's because they need the acid from the cocoa in order to make it rise. So we remove the acid. It makes it easier to homogenize it so it won't separate um, when you mix with water or mix with fat. Um, there's a gentleman named Henry Nestle. So we all know Nestle's, right? Comes from Switzerland. In the 1850s, there was an Englishman named Joseph Fry. This is, this is a quote from Nestle. In 1850s, in the 1850s, Englishman Joseph Fry changed my life by adding more cocoa butter rather than hot water to the cocoa powder and sugar. And then that's how he made the first chocolate. He really made the first cho chocolate. Um, he claims to make the first chocolate bar. Um, in 1875, um, Nestle's added condensed milk to solid chocolate, creating the, the milk chocolate bar. So that was sort of our first, you know, as we know it, that's when the chocolate bar came as the 1850s. So then there's somebody named John Cadbury. So are you familiar with Cadbury chocolate? Oh, yeah. British, yep, British company. Uh, this is one of their, uh, showing one of their vintage bars, dairy uh, milk chocolate. In 1824, he's a Quaker. He began selling tea, coffee, and drinking chocolate in Bull Street um, in, in uh, London. From 1831, he moved into a production of a variety of cocoa and drinking chocolates, sold mainly to the wealthy because it was so um, costly to produce. Um, I gave a lecture on um, Arthur Guinness and the story of the, the Guinness um, Beer Company. And um, John Cadbury actually was a, an inspiration to Arthur Guinness. John Cadbury moved his, his factory, his chocolate factory. He wanted to expand. He had a little shop in London. He wanted to, to be able to produce more chocolate. 
um, and go into a to and appeal to a better, bigger market, make the cost less, sell to more people. Uh, he needed space, and so he moved out to the suburbs of London, and he built a um, company town. It's which is what we would know it. And that that in some ways that's kind of a um, you think bad things about. There's a bad image about a company town, but Cadbury had um, a wonderful town that he he built for his for his workers, so that when they went home at night, there was some. Um, there was a movie theater. I mean, they had all kinds of, there's um, healthcare for them. Um, and it ended up, you know, he really took care of his employees. When Arthur Guinness was, wanted to expand um, and was uh, with his, um, his plant, his um, distillery in, um, in, uh, in yeah, Ireland, um, he, everybody, his employees went home to squalor, absolute squalor. They lived in horrendous conditions. Um, they were getting sick all the time. He was having problems producing the beer because he didn't have enough workers. And so um, he had heard about John Cadbury. He travels to Cadbury's company town and uh, went back to Ireland and to Dublin. <coughs> he totally bought all the land around his factory, built proper homes for them, had health care for his employees. And that was all because Cadbury really had, had you know, um, started that philosophy that you need to take care of your employees. And if you take care of your employees, they'll take care of you and um, you get more production out of your employees and you make more money uh, because you're going to produce more. So uh, that, that was, that's just a side story about John Cadbury. But um, so he's, he's British. So they're, they're making um, the Cadbury bar. In 1879, we have lint, which you know is still something we can buy today. Yeah. Um, so, and so far, you know, we've talked about Nestle. We can still buy a Nestle bar. You can still buy um, Cadbury bars. Um, lint is still available. These, co these companies have been around for hundreds of years. 1879, he's Swiss. Um, he invented the conch. It's a machine that rotated and mixed chocolate to a perfect smooth consistency. And this would be really critical to um, John Milton Hershey. Um, that conching process allows you to take the chocolate, those nibs, and mix it with milk and not have it and homogenize it so it doesn't separate. And you end up with a smooth um, chocolate um, mm -hmm. consistency. So, so that was, um, that was Lint's um, contribution to the processing of chocolate. And again, that was that discovery for Milton Hershey would, would really change everything for him that he could make this milk chocolate bar, um, which people liked better, less bitter, um, and he could mass produce it. So then we get to Hershey. Um, has anybody been to Hershey, Pennsylvania? Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it smells like you. I, I, my recollection is that it did smell like chocolate. They were, yeah, the whole <laughs> town does. Yeah, the whole town does. The Hershey process of making milk chocolate. So Hershey really, um, he didn't develop the chocolate bar. We, we know that um, Nestle really was the first one to produce the chocolate bar. But he was the first person to mass produce it. Um, he put his factory uh, in rural uh, Pennsylvania, which was dairy land. And why? Because he needed milk. Um, so the process was developed by Hershey and he really is the first person to mass produce chocolate in the US. And now it was accessible to the masses. And one, then one of the most brilliant things Hershey ever did, um, and this is just, this is, um, I'll skip, uh -huh. I'll come back to this one, but. Um, so do you see this bar right here, U.S. Army Field Ration D? Uh, yeah. and, and then you see the tropical chocolate bar. So those, uh -huh. uh, the U.S. government came to um, Hershey and said, we would like to give our troops a Hershey bar uh, when they're fighting world in the World War. And so he, um, he got the contract uh, for the rations. And what did the, then the soldiers came back to America and what did they want? Oh. A Hershey bar. Um, so Coca-Cola did the same thing. Coca-Cola, there was a lot of Coca-Cola going over to the troops. Um, and again, you know, when they came back to America um, from the war, they all wanted Coke and, and uh, Hershey chocolate. Um, so uh, 1907, um, he did divided the, uh, the Hershey kiss. And um, in 1907, they were making 33 million kisses a day. And I'm not sure what they produced the day. Today, over 3 billion tons of cacao supplies and a $35 billion chocolate industry for Hershey. 
And so here's just some kind of old memories. Does anybody remember a five cent Hershey bar? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a quarter when I was growing up. That's my recollection. It may have been 25 cents when I was a kid. So. Um, Hershey Kisses. Uh, and again, here's the US Army field ration. Um, the, Hers the tropical Hershey bar, they had to actually go and do research on it and figure out how it would not, um, my notes on that, how it wouldn't melt. So the mm. tropical bars formula was designed to mm -hmm. allow the bar to hold its shape after one hour in 120 degree heat. Wow. So um, they were able to do that. Um, I don't know what the taste was, but um, but that was that was uh, what the government uh, actually specification for the government contract was to have a bar that they could send to warmer climates. So um, Korea, you know, would have been warm. Um, Philippines and all those places that, that our troops were fighting. So um, so then if you had been here, I would have made Russian hot chocolate for you. <laughs> um, Russian hot chocolate, I have to tell you, if you like chocolate, I am my and uh, it's the best dessert I've ever had. And it's very rich, can't have too much of it. So this woman's recipe, it's Gail Gand is her name. Um, I went to St. Petersburg in November of 2002 with my husband and stumbled upon a little coffee place with a slow turning dasher, massaging a smooth, dark tar looking substance. The counter girl channeled the velvety hot chocolate soup into demitasse cups and handed us a tiny spoon. We weren't sure what to do next. And then we saw others skimming off a taste of the mixture a spoonful at a time. So it's served with an orange creme fraiche. I personally don't do creme fraiche. I just whip um, cream, whipped cream. And then I take the rind from an entire orange and just um, fold it in. But you do need that orange chocolate in every bite. So what you do is you take a little bit of the cream and then get a little bit of the chocolate with every bite. Um, it is fabulous. I'm gonna, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about that in a minute. I can go over the recipes with you, which I sent you, but we're gonna watch one last video. Um, okay, so we're gonna stop share. Screen share and we'll go to the oh, that's not it. Did I lose it? Hmm, I can get it back. Hold on. Hold on, let me see. I think we lost it, but that's okay. No, I'll just I'll just I'm gonna well can I can I do that? I can get this though. It's not gonna show on theirs, but that's okay. Right? So I have to go to my desktop. Well, let me see if you're sharing a screen. Let me see if I'm sharing screen. Because I, I just cut and pasted it. But I don't it's, good question. it's not, right? Or is it? Do you see it in there? No. Okay. Okay. Um, so let me go. Hold on. I got to go here. Um, I'm going to go to Google Chrome. Hit that. That's it. Are you good? Is it? Yep, I'm good. Oh, here, make this bigger. Can I have it for you in a second? Where is it? This one. Okay. Oh, yes, here's that. And share. Okay. This is the same gentleman. I don't know why he's wearing a down. Okay. I don't know why he's wearing a down jacket. Our promise to deliver. Today, I'll do something that I can pretty confidently say no one's ever done before. Winter is coming. It's getting Oops, what happened? Okay. Getting colder, which means... Means that in addition to winter jackets, we need something that I would argue is far more important, hot chocolate. Now, obviously people have made hot chocolate before, but where does chocolate come from? And yeah, they've probably said they've made it from scratch, but what does scratch really mean? I guess that question can be answered by saying where chocolate comes from, which is from a cacao pod. That's right, today I'm gonna make hot chocolate all the way from a cacao pod. These came all the way from Ecuador. In fact, Customs actually stopped the box and checked out what was inside. Turns out it was just a bunch of cacao pods. These pods come in all shapes and sizes and all different colors. I even have one that's a beautiful yellow orange, which I've never seen before. Most people have never seen a cacao pod. They just know what chocolate looks like and what it's supposed to taste like. But this is where it all begins. I used to be a white belt in karate. Now maybe that was too hard of a chop, but the important thing for you to see here is what's inside. Within the pod is a bunch of gooey, slimy coated seeds. Just listen to the sound they make. 
I'm gonna add my seeds to a bowl and then let these ferment for about a week. This is really gonna develop that chocolate flavor prior to roasting our seeds. So they've now fermented and they're almost this brownish kind of weird looking off-white. They also definitely smell different. You know, they have that similar kind of yeasty alcoholic smell that bread would get. I'm now gonna spread these out on a tray and roast them at about 325 for about an hour and a half or so. While we wait, let's make a few homemade marshmallows. Honestly, I made them for the first time last winter and I'm telling you that nothing beats homemade marshmallows. In a mixing bowl, combine half a cup of cold water with two and a half tablespoons or about three packets of gelatin. Let this sit for 15 minutes. In a saucepan, combine half a cup of water, third cup corn syrup, two cups of granulated sugar, and just a little pinch of salt. Bring it to a boil over high heat. You can swirl it around once in a while, but don't stir it. When it reaches 240 Fahrenheit, remove it from the heat. Whisking slowly, gently begin to pour in your sugar mixture. It's actually gonna smell a little bit weird right now, but that's okay, it'll go away, I promise. Turn your mixture up to high speed for 10 to 12 minutes. It's gonna expand a lot, but just let it happen. At the end, add in a little bit of vanilla extract for flavor if you want. And turn this off when the outside of the bowl is just barely warm. You wanna move really quickly now. Brush or spray this with just a little bit of oil, then add your marshmallow. Try to spread it out nice and evenly here. And again, the quicker you can do this, the easier it'll be to work with. I just wanna say that I'm about half an hour into the roasting process and my entire apartment smells like a chocolate factory. Never did I think that these seeds could make the smells that they are. It smells just like a chocolate bar. So if you look really closely, what we have here looks almost like a little dinosaur egg. And if I break this apart with my fingers, these little crumbles that I get are cacao nymphs, which I'm sure you've seen before. And as I continue to break open the shells on all of these seeds, I'll get more and more and more of these nibs. These are what are blended up into a nice fine paste to make chocolate. Now that I've collected a nice little jar of cacao nibs, I'll pour them into a spice grinder and gently pulse until I make a fine powder, somewhat like cocoa powder. Now I've made somewhat of a cocoa dust. And if you're following this recipe and want to make really good hot cocoa, but don't have cacao pods to start with, started this up with some unsweetened cocoa powder. Now to go with that, we're also going to use some powdered hot chocolate. Don't you ever use that stuff again. I'd rather go pick up a bunch of dirt from my nearby park than actually use that stuff. We're making real hot chocolate. To a small saucepan, we'll add about a half cup cocoa powder, or our ground up cacao nibs in this case, a third cup brown sugar, a third cup granulated sugar, four tablespoons of heavy cream, four cups of whole milk, and by the way, you can use alternative milk, so oat milk will work great with this recipe, a teaspoon of vanilla extract, and just a tiny little pinch of salt. Whisk this up over medium heat to dissolve all the sugar. And then I have a trick that's gonna blow your mind. Add your hot chocolate to a blender, then crank it up. You may have to do this in two batches because the goal is to get the blender as high as possible, which will pump as many air bubbles as you can get into this hot chocolate, making it the lightest, foamiest hot chocolate you've ever had. Now, no hot chocolate's complete without good marshmallows. But once our marshmallow is set, we'll dump it down onto our cutting board. If you're gonna make marshmallows, make sure you oil them well, because this is a pain in the butt to get off. Now, let's add a little more powder on top of our marshmallows so they don't stick to each other. This is no different than flouring your cutting board when making pizza or pasta. Before cutting, I wanna oil my knife to make sure that it doesn't get stuck when it cuts through the marshmallow. Then, I'll cut this into nice, big cubes, oh dusting as I go. My goal here is to get these perfect, nice, giant marshmallow cubes out of this. And that right there was a nice, clean cut. Now I'll go ahead and cut this into big cubes. Roll them all in the powder and they're complete. That right there is a beautiful homemade marshmallow. Now we'll add our foamy hot chocolate along with our nice homemade marshmallow. And of course, we're gonna torch the top of it. For me, the fact that we started with this and ended up with this is incredible. And if you didn't believe me about the foam, I hope you do now. This is the lightest, foamiest <laughs> hot chocolate you will ever have. And it doesn't get any fresher than this. Please don't forget to subscribe. And I always want to get out of it. Wait, what did I do? Okay, hold on. What did I do? I can't move, guys. I'm pushing you out to your seat. I can't fight the wind anymore. We're going to send for a walk. I was going to say stop share. Stop share. Okay. Right. All right, one more thing to show you, and um, and that is just to go through the recipes. So let's see if I can hot chocolate recipes. Okay. Okay. So um, I encourage you. That was pretty difficult to make cocoa, but kind of a fun project if you're into that. Um, uh, and pretty neat to see how it goes from the pod to to making cocoa. But again. What did we see? The same thing, getting that air in it and drinking it through the foam. So, um, and that's been the way cocoa has been um, 
served since uh, the 60, 600 AD. Um, so Russian hot chocolate is, um, I, as I said, you can do the creme fraiche if you want. Uh, I do, I just make whipped cream and add a, the rind to from the orange rind. And basically what Russian hot chocolate is, is it's just a, a very thin chocolate pudding. So um, you're doing a third of a cup of sugar, two tablespoons of cornstarch, you mix that together in the, in the pan. If you don't do that, the cornstarch will um, be lumpy. So that's why we mix the sugar, the dry sugar, the cornstarch, add the heavy, it's a one and a quarter cups of heavy cream, one and a quarter cups of whole milk, um, vanilla bean or vanilla extract. Um, you do seven ounces of bittersweet chocolate. I actually just use Toll House bits. Um, I don't even bother chopping them. And then three tablespoons of butter. I don't add that in. I think that's overkill, but if you'd like to make it really rich. So you make the pudding, you buy, um, pour the mixture in a stainless steel saucepan, bring it to a boil, whisking until thickened, it'll get nice and thick. Um, and then just add the chocolate till it melts and then serve it. And you can, you can cool it. And then if you want, you know, if there's leftover for tomorrow, you can reheat it very delicately in a microwave, it does work. Um, uh, and then I do recommend serving it in a small demi tasse cup because it's really rich. I mean, I, you really wouldn't want it. I couldn't eat a whole eight ounce portion of it, but it's really good. Uh, I just wanted to share with you some other chocolates from around the world. This one is um, a Swiss, uh, France, Switzerland and Belgium. And it's a half a cup of water, uh, chocolate, sugar and some warm milk. So this is um, more of the liquidy one that maybe we get when we do the Swiss mix kind of thing where you just add hot water. So this is gonna be a thin hot chocolate. And then another country, um, this is Italian. Um, this is hot chocolate with orange whipped cream, has bittersweet chocolate, sugar, whole milk. Um, again, the, then they do the same thing I do. I just take the whipped cream and, and fold in the, the zest of an orange. The orange and the chocolate combination is delicious. Um, this is an Austrian version, um, two ounces of bittersweet chocolate, at least 70% cacao. Uh, water, sugar, and milk. So um, kind of like the American chocolate, but again, they're adding, they do add some water to it. Um, mocha, uh, which is the, where you would add espresso powder to it. Um, so that's that cho chocolate and, and uh, cocoa flavor mix. Uh, Mexican, um, the, the key ingredient here is the ground cinnamon. So they, they typically would add cinnamon to it. Um, this is actually a recipe for a mix that if you wanted to give it away as a gift, that's why it's made with dry, dry powdered milk. Um, if you want to add cinnamon to it, you would add the cinnamon at the time you do the, sh the with the sugar. Um, because again, cinnamon doesn't mix really well with water unless it's mixed with sugar first. So it's, I'm gonna try it. um, now the Turkish, um, they do coffee, cardamom, um, water, milk, sugar. And this one asks for chocolate syrup. So the cardamom would be a Turkish style. That's all I gave you. So has anybody had chocolate, in, hot chocolate in Europe that was different or, or anywhere? I wish I had. <laughs> yeah, I, I got, to, I was on a cruise from Stockholm, Sweden to the Baltic Sea. We went from Stockholm to Helsinki to St. Petersburg, Russia, town of Estonia, and then to Copenhagen. And when we were in Copenhagen, we went to Tivoli Gardens. And it was, um, it was August, but it was one of those rainy, damp, cold days. So we decided to stop at Tivoli and had some hot chocolate. And it was actually just a big chunk of chocolate uh, on the bottom of your cup. And then they just pour really hot milk. Wow. And then you kind of mixed it yourself. And then eventually at the end, you had this sludge, which was of course delicious. <laughs> so at the end, though, that was pretty cool. So that's my memory of, of having hot chocolate in uh, Denmark. So um, does anybody have questions? I sent you the recipes. Um, the Russian hot chocolate is very easy to make. I mean, I have to say, man, it's, it's more of a dessert, but it's, um, it is really, really good. So. That was very interesting. Thank you, Holly. Good. I hope you all learned something. I think, um, I don't know, I think I'm trying to plan in April. We're going to do Mozart's week um, in April, the end of April. And I think I'll do another food history uh, 
and it's a dessert that actually um, comes from Salzburg, Austria, called, and I can't pronounce it, but um, it's like a vanilla souffle. It's kind of, um, and it's, my, my grandmother made it. Um, I, I, my grandmother, who I thought was German, but turned out she was Irish Catholic, and married my <laughs> grandmother, who was German. So a short story is that my grandmother um, lost her mother when she was very young. I want to say my grandmother was probably six years old. And in those days, a single man would not raise his children. So they either, he had to remarry very quickly or he, the, the children would be farmed off to relatives. And he didn't want to lose his girls and he wanted, um. so he married the first woman he could find. And her name was Minnie. Minnie was their housekeeper. She was German, did not speak uh. a lot of English. Um, she wanted to stay in America and uh, so it worked. And my grandmother, she only spoke German. So my grandmother at age five, when kids pick up languages very easily. Um, so she learned German and then, Fast forward, my grandfather came over from Germany to, to avoid the war. Uh, and he, the only work he could get was in a diner, although my grandfather had been working for Shell Oil and had a job where he worked coat and tie to work. But he knew that uh, Hitler was coming and needed to get out. So he just left and uh, he got a job as a dishwasher and didn't speak a lot of English and in this town where my grandmother lived. And someone said, Gerhard was his name, very German name. You need to be Lillian. Lillian speaks German and she's the only one in town his age who could speak German. And that's how they met and they got married. Um, and, and so she cooked German because, well, she why did she cook German? Because her stepmother was German and that's what Minnie knew had to cook. So uh, so we always thought she was our German grandmother. And it turned out she really was born in Brooklyn and was Irish Catholic. And um, but uh, unfortunately for us, we like German food. So I'm very pleased that uh, we got to enjoy that from grandma, but um, anyway, so. Um, uh, Thank you for the recipes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, hopefully, very nice. uh, yeah, try, try the, the uh, Russian one, you'll, you'll enjoy it. And you can make a half a recipe on it too, very easy to do. So thanks for coming and well, thank um, you. take care. Thank you. And thank enjoy you so the much. Enjoy the sunshine, bye.